What up, Dragon Ballers? We are back for another episode review for Dragon Ball Daima. Today, we're going to be discussing episode two called Glorio. Glorio is the name of a new character that is going to be joining our heroes on this adventure. He is formally introduced in this episode, along with all of our heroes now fully miniaturized. We get to see the fallout from that wish. So this should go without saying, but full spoilers are ahead. If you guys haven't done so, make sure you guys hit that subscribe button for more Daima review content. Also, make sure you guys check out episode one. I did a full retelling of the first episode. I'm going to try to incorporate a few more screenshots in this episode just so you guys have something to look at because in the last episode, we really didn't have much to look at, mainly out of just my fear of showing stuff. But I think showing screenshots here and there is not going to be a problem. So we'll at least have that. So without further ado, let's jump in. All right, so we open the episode with another look at Shenron as Shenron is granting the wish to Goma, Degesu, and Neva as they try to nerf our heroes by turning them small. This is where a fun little twist appears that I was not expecting. Shenron only grants them one wish. And when they ask why they are not being given two other wishes, Shenron says that this is only a perk for regular customers. Newcomers do not get three wishes. Newcomers only get one wish. So once again, I feel like this is more of a playful thing at this point where they're just playing it fast and loose with certain aspects of Dragon Ball's continuity. Before I talked about how the Patara, some of the properties of Patara was retcon. Some of you guys said that it's not exactly a retcon, it's kind of like they're just expanding on the, the properties of Patara. So sure, I mean, however you look at it, it's just funny that they're once again adding a new twist to something that was seemingly already established. We know that Shenron is able to give three wishes, but now there's an exception to newcomers. We never experienced that in Dragon Ball Z. So I, I think that that's a pretty funny twist. I was laughing the whole time because I was just thinking, man, imagine getting th knowing you're going to be getting three wishes and then you don't get two more because the person giving you the wishes doesn't like you. So as Goma and the villains are reacting to this news, we go back to the heroes. We see Goku and Vegeta now having fully shrunk. They crash to the ground because they were originally fighting and training in the air. Now that they've all shrunk, they're not able to balance their key. They're not able to utilize all of the functions that they are usually able to do as Saiyan warriors. Everyone else is shrunk. You see Yamcha, you see Ox King, you see Mr. Satan, you see Roshi, Krillin, Bulma, everybody. It makes me wonder, we, we don't get to see a shot of this in the episode, but is Elder Kai also shrunk? Because he would just be Kai. Or no, he no, he would be a kid, but he would just be chilling in the land of the Kais probably. So I, I wonder if we're going to see him later on in the, in the show. And then the intro plays for the first time all the way through. We get to see a lot of cool shots in this intro. But the one that stands out to me the most is that we actually get to see, I believe, the first shot of Deborah's father known as Abura. Abura is basically a chubbier version of Deborah, which is funny because the way that I equate it is like Beerus and Shampa. But it's, it's cool that we get to see that for the first time. I wonder if we're going to actually explore the history of Abura and how this tertiary Oculus evil eye artifact that Goma is talking about, where that's going to actually come into play. I do hope that we get a little bit of a flashback to that. The intro is very good, by the way. Even if you're not watching Daima, I would strongly recommend that you guys check out the intro because the song is great. I would say probably this intro has got to be top three for me personally in terms of Dragon Ball intros. Number one has got to be Limit Breaker Survive from Dragon Ball Super Tournament of Power. Number two is probably Dragon Soul from Dragon Ball Z Kai. And then this has to, this easily is number three. I'm sure over time it will probably go even higher, but this song is really well made. I think that this is going to be a lot of people's new favorite intro. So let me know in the comments what you guys think about the intro. After the intro plays, we go back to the lookout where Goma asks Neva whether he can get the Demon Dragon Balls. Neva reminds him that in order to do that, he's going to have to defeat the Tamagamis, which are those mech warrior guardians of the Demon Dragon Balls. We see them in the intro, actually, so they will play a part at some point. Goma then proceeds to ask why Neva can't just use the same trick that he just used on these Dragon Balls again. And that was exactly what I was thinking. Why not use that again? That's such an overpowered move. You brought all the balls over when they were just used recently for Majin Buu. Why can't you do it again? Neva then says he can't use that trick twice in a row. Now, I don't know the limitation of this power past that point because that's all that he says. How much is twice in a row? Is it within a day, within two days, within a year, or forever? 
we don't actually know but the point is he can't use that trick again so basically the villains wished for the heroes to become nerfed and that's all that happened goma then says if he had known that this was going to be the case he would have wished for that evil eye artifact instead which would have also then been very interesting how powerful would a powered up goma be compared to our full power heroes with the super saiyan 3 goku super saiyan 2 vegeta those types of characters that would have been an interesting scenario to explore at some point we then see our first shot of mini dende and mini popo and the biggest surprise of all is that popo's turban is no longer on his head and we see what has been underneath his turban for all these years he's got some horns never thought i'd see that but he does goma and degesu and neva take dende as hostage as they leave the lookout we come back to our heroes who are still reacting to the fallout from being shrunk goten and trunks are babies who are still communicating with each other seemingly telepathically i don't think it's actually a telepathic communication i think it's more like they're goo goo ga at each other but they're providing some sort of translations through the the echo effect bulma is loving how much younger she looks her skin is radiant she's checking out her husband vegeta saying how cute he is vegeta doesn't recognize mr satan at all mr satan does look very different without all the facial hair speaking of looking different Roshi looks very different. Roshi basically looks like Krillin with a nose now. And it's actually really funny how Roshi is loving every minute of this. Krillin points out that everyone looks physically younger, but they're mentally still the same coherent beings that they were before. So it's really that they were just nerfed into smaller bodies. I think that it would have probably been a little too much of an overkill if Goku and friends were turned into actual kids in every way where they're immature, they don't understand the scope of the situation. I think that would have probably made for a pretty unbelievable adventure. How could a six-year-old, you know, do all of these different things? That probably would have been less believable. So I, I think that makes a lot of sense. Piccolo says this all might have something to do with Shenron, considering that the sky went black before they all shrunk. So Goku tries to fly to investigate, but as he tries to fly, he is unable to maintain balance and he crashes into a table, which explains why Goku and Vegeta fell in the first place when they were originally floating in the sky when they were training. It's because their bodies are unable to balance all of these powers at the moment. They are not used to their new bodies, so they are unable to fly. They're unable to do some of the normal things that they were able to do before. Kabito then teleports everybody to the lookout and then they find out from Popo that Dende had been kidnapped by beings with pointy ears from the demon realm. When Popo says this, Shin has a noticeable reaction. Supreme Kai, obviously, because his younger brother, Degesu, is in the demon realm. And that's when they learn about Degesu because Popo says Degesu. Piccolo then has a reaction to the name Neva. Piccolo then goes on to say that Neva was the legendary Namekian who alone protected the demon Dragon Balls in the demon realm. Trying to figure out how they're going to possibly travel to the demon realm, Shin asks Kibito to bring back their old spaceship. The spaceship is what Shin used to use to travel into this universe to begin with. So once again, reinforcing the fact that he is not from here. He is, in fact, from the demon world. So when he said that, it made me wonder, does that mean that every Kai is from the demon world? Goasu? Uh, all the various Kais we saw in the Tournament of Power, are they all from the demon world originally? Are they all from the same place? And then they all dispersed and went to their own respective universes? Kibito brings Vegeta and Bulma to the lookout to have Bulma take a look and do some repairs. As Bulma inspects the ship, she notices that it's very much damaged. And this was apparently due to the fact that Goku and Kid Buu and Vegeta were all battling on the land of the Kais. So I guess in all that commotion and chaos, their ship was damaged? We don't know exactly the logistics of it, but it was probably buried somewhere or maybe it was just standing out there somewhere and some debris probably hit it or maybe some blasts hit it. I don't know. But that's, that's how they choose to explain why the ship was so badly damaged. Bulma says it'll take about 10 days to repair the ship. So then we move ahead to about two days later. Goku has since been training, getting accustomed to the new body while Bulma's working on repairs. Goku notices that his depth perception is off. This was a nice little touch. He was trying to do some strikes and some kicks. And so where he thought his punches and kicks were going to land, they didn't exactly land. So he realized... He's going to need more than just his own physical combat abilities. He's going to need some help. So as he leaves, Vegeta starts talking to Supreme Kai and Kibito a little bit more about what's been going on. Vegeta asks, is every pointy ear person from the demon realm? We've all been thinking it, right? Some of you guys mentioned Topo. He's got to be a demon. All the other Kais have to be a demon. 
Tapion should be a demon, technically. Well, he's not canon. I guess that doesn't count. Shin says that not everyone is from the demon world, but most are. Apparently, a long time ago, there was a big desire for a lot of people to either leave the demon realm to conquer other worlds or to simply just be free. During that time, also, a lot of Majins slipped out of the demon realm as well. Majin is basically a term for demons, uh, evil beings. Goma is considered a Majin because when they were discussing Goma, they, they mentioned the word Majin. So it's basically just like evil figures, demons, that sort of thing. But eventually, because so many people kept doing it, it became forbidden. So now only those who have special permission are allowed to leave the demon realm. So while these guys are having this discussion, Goku visits Korin right below the lookout. And it was really nice to see Goku standing side by side with Korin, sort of a visual callback to the original Dragon Ball where Kid Goku first met Korin. But even more of a callback, Goku asks about his power pole. And he asks where it is because originally the power pole was used as a connecting measure to take you from Korin's tower all the way to the lookout. Korin then responds saying that Roshi now possesses the pole because the last time he checked, Roshi had it. So as Goku leaves, Korin tells Goku that he should probably also pick up the Nimbus Cloud, which sadly he doesn't do in this episode, but I really hope that he does. I think he will because we're recapturing, we're kind of going back to the original iconic Dragon Ball look. Kid Goku with the power pole, with the cloud, flying all over the place, going on these adventures. That is peak Dragon Ball, and we got to see that back. We have to see that come back. When Goku finally reaches Master Roshi's place, he sees Roshi admiring himself in the mirror again, this time in a new outfit, and Goku then asks him where the pole is. After much pestering, Goku finally gets the pole, but we see while Goku is talking to Roshi and Roshi can't remember, we get a shot of Turtle nervously looking at the pole. I, I don't know if it's because he didn't want Goku to discover what they had done with the pole, but the pole is now being used to dry laundry, which I thought was a hilarious touch. I mean, what else are you gonna use the pole for, right? Goku is so powerful that a pole is not going to be a useful tool for someone like him anymore. Goku then takes the power pole and goes back to the lookout where he then shows off his power pole skills. So I guess he didn't lose his, his weapon wielding prowess. He only lost his ability to fly, but he can still fight normally and he can still wield the power pole. It was a really nice animation to see. And that's one of the things that we saw in promotional material before Daima even aired. So we've seen that before. I mean, it's it's classic Dragon Ball. Seeing Goku using the power pole is pretty nice. Goku then asks Piccolo about the Demon Realm. Piccolo was never born there, he says, but he reveals that Namix used to live there. Again, I, I don't remember the details of Dragon Ball, but I'm pretty sure that that was never a story beat that was ever acknowledged before. Like we know Demon King Piccolo came to Earth from the planet Namek. We never knew that the Namekians originally lived in the Demon Realm. Not to my knowledge, anyway. Bulma then asks, why did they escape? Why did the Namekians leave the Demon Realm? Piccolo then says it was because Namics don't like to be ruled. I don't think that's really a, a Namekian-specific thing, to be honest. I don't think anybody would like being ruled, but that's the explanation that they gave. Suddenly, a flash of light appears above the lookout. Nobody can sense anything because apparently all of their senses have been nerfed as well, so they can't sense any malice coming from this ship that is approaching them on the lookout. The ship then lands and out steps the person who was spying on Goma and Degesu back in the Demon Realm. He introduces himself as Glorio. He then identifies Goku and makes a request for Goku to come back with him to the Demon Realm in order to defeat Goma. Shin then asks Glorio how he knows about Goku. Glorio then says that he was secretly asked by the king of the third Demon World to seek out Goku after witnessing his battle with Majin Buu from a magical monitor. We've already seen what the magical monitor looks like because we saw that in episode one. The king from the third demon world, I'm assuming is just another king and probably one that is a little bit less malevolent like Goma and wants Goma to be taken down. Maybe it's for, for good reasons. Maybe it's for the wrong reasons. Maybe Goma usurped the throne before the third king of uh, the king of the third demon world had a chance to do anything. We don't know exactly the true motivations, but we know that Gloria is being honest about it, or at least I feel like it. Shin, not so sure. So Shin then says, I'm going to come with you and Goku. We're going to go to the demon world and we're going to sort this all out. He obviously has a vested interest in all this stuff because his family is directly involved. And then they get into the ship, they take off and a new adventure begins. And that ends the episode. Then we see the outro where they show a bunch of shots of Goku, Glorio, Vegeta, 
Piccolo, another character who will probably be introduced to in the next episode. It shows us various aspects of the demon world. So now we know what they're going to do and where they're going to go, but how it's all going to play out remains to be seen. And that's where the next episode will come in, which will be airing next week. So overall, I did enjoy this episode, but I think I like the first episode a little bit more, which is totally fine. The first episode had the the extra shock value, the appeal of showing me a brand new style for the Dragon Ball animation. We also saw a lot of the flashback art for Cell, Kid Buu, all the various things that happened in Z. We actually saw a little bit of that in this episode too with a flashback to the Super Saiyan 3 Goku Kid Buu fight. But overall, they're just setting up for the adventure. So with another, what, 18 plus episodes to go in Daima, we're now gonna truly explore this whole new world and we're gonna see what it has in store for us. I loved learning how all of our heroes are reacting to this new reality where they're younger. Some like it, some hate it, some were having the time of their lives, like Roshi, for example. I wanna see more in regards to the fallout from this. I wanna see more repercussions. How is this going to affect Bulma in terms of her work at Capsule Corp? How is this going to affect Mr. Satan now that he is a kid? Are they gonna show these little bits and pieces of how this one wish is going to cascade into all sorts of problems throughout Daima? I wanna see what happened with Elder Kai because he was definitely a part of this. So he has to be also wished back. So what, what is he doing on the land of the Kais? There's, there's, there's so much just from that alone that I wanna see that has nothing to do with even the, with the demon world. They nailed it with this episode. The tone was great. The way that they're setting up everything was great. I can't wait to watch the next one, which will be in seven days. Oh, seven grueling days having to wait for the next Dime episode. I would say it's punishment, but you know what? The fact that we're getting anything from Dragon Ball is better than nothing. So I can't wait for the next one. Hopefully you guys enjoyed this review. I will give this episode. What did I give the last one? Like an A, A minus? I'll give this one the same. It's I, I, it's, I'm definitely biased. I don't think I can give a fair objective score. So feel free to give your honest opinions in the comments down below. Let me know if there's anything else that I missed because I'm sure that there was. I don't know if I got everything. I wrote down notes pretty diligently, but I'm sure that there were some things that I missed. I'd love to hear from you guys. Thank you so much for watching. I will catch you guys next week and make sure to Daima responsibly. Bye-bye.